Hello, welcome to episode 27 of Composer Cast. On this episode, we do a really fun interview with a composer and what did, what did he call himself? He a, called himself a music designer. A music designer, yeah. Matthew Walker. And uh, he was a very, very nice man. Yeah. Lots and lots of interesting stuff about how he goes about composing music. Um, lots of, we got a bit philosophical. Yeah, it was nice. We turned into hippies for a bit. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to dive right in because um, it is quite quite a long episode, but lots of good stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. And over to Matthew. What first sparked your passion for music? Um, it's difficult to kind of say without it sounding a bit run of the mill. So <laughs> I began playing piano um, around the age of, of seven. Uh, by default, really, uh, my brother um, played and we had this really beat up honky tonk sounding piano like most most starter pianos. Yeah. Um, and my brother played a bit and and, uh, and, and that was fine, but um, it didn't really kind of captivate too much with him. So, uh, yeah, I just took to it from that. And it was something that was um, I was quite encouraged by how easy I found it to, to, to sort of put notes together. We're talking about really basic stuff here. Yeah. But um. Like, I would just kind of play a note and go, oh, that one doesn't sound good. Oh, that one sounds good. And you just start to memorise kind of combinations. And I'm, I'm like seven or eight at this point. So I, just, I got really encouraged by how easy I found to put notes and then form chords, these new things called chords. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. So I just kind of had this, this fascination with it, really. Um, and then it just started this kind of snowball impact of... of getting involved in little ensembles at school and performing in theatre and doing other bits and pieces. Yeah, it remained a very dormant hobby until I was about 21, really, until I, I couldn't do um, sport anymore. That was always my, my big fascination. I was part of the football team, captain of the football team, cricket, athletics, rugby, um, rounders, loved rounders, <laughs> athletics. Love rounders well. um, oh, yeah, I'd love a good game of rounders. Yeah. And... Um, and that was always my fascination, but then I couldn't, I couldn't do that anymore. Certainly contact sports I couldn't do in my early 20s. So then I was like, well, okay, well, what else can I do? This, this piano thing's still with me. And by this point, I'd been doing a lot more songwriting and I'd done a bit of singing in theatre uh, and then started to take it a bit more seriously and then study that at university and then realised what I wanted to do afterwards. Um, but yeah, it, it started with very much a, a family had a piano, played a bit, found it quite easy, and that was it. And then started a fascination with songwriting and kind of I listened to a lot of Elton John and Carpenters and uh, Commodores, these big kind of 70s, 80s uh, singer-songwriting sounds. Um, I did go back to it in secondary school where I started having keyboard skills. I don't know why they call it keyboard <laughs> skills. I, I've always found that quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then started to take it semi-seriously again. But uh, yeah, I did have lessons, but, but fell out of love quite, quite quickly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I found uh, school uh, music lessons were awful. So me and Lloyd went to the same school, and right. did did you find them awful as well? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> because it was a, it felt very unorganised. It felt like the music department in our school was like, oh, they're just yeah. it's just the music department. You know, let's let's give them a couple bongos. One of those things that goes <laughs> <laughs> one of those, and then you know, shaped like a frog, shaped like a little yeah. frog. With it always felt a bit like an afterthought, didn't it? Yeah. Same in our school. It was. You know, there was there was very minimal budget for anything if yeah. you were lucky. You know, if when there was a concert, like we had a summer concert, a winter concert, and I think that was kind of it. We might be lucky to get another one in, but they were really big events because we were we had a really a lot of my friends weren't particularly musical, but so I but through music I, I got involved with other circles of friends in the same year who were musical and and they became good friends afterwards. But they weren't my, my, my default circle. It was all the jocks, all the sport guys, right? You went from being a jock to a nerd, didn't you? <laughs> uh, very much. I mean, uh, we, uh, a guy, um, Matt Davis, another Matt who, who I, I podcast with, which we'll talk about later, yeah. um, I, was, I was telling him about how I've always been... I, I became a hybrid. So, you know, I, I've literally... Only this morning, I've just come back from a, a good little football session just, just now. So those, that's what I know. But then working with, in, certainly in games, you get to know real nerds <laughs> and amazing, pers amazing people, you know, really amazing people. And I've always found it really quite easy to, to float between both crowds. Um, as I've gotten older, I'm definitely more of a nerd than I am 
a, a jock. I think I just I probably look like a jock, but um, <laughs> but I'm definitely a nerd on the inside. You've got, uh, you've yeah, got the outer, a hybrid. Sh- outer shell of a jock, and then the the inside <laughs> of a nerd. Yeah, I'm I'm balancing this weird double life, and it's uh, it's a challenge at times. <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde. How did your interest in uh, video game music start? So going on from learning the piano and stuff, and then going into video games. Yeah. Um, so I've always been a gamer. I've always played games. Um, and that's one one shared interest that I did have with with my jock friends. Yeah, we always played games. So Mega Drive, NES, NES, uh, Game Boys. You know, proper old school consoles. Yeah. Um, and that was always a fascination. But it wasn't until sort of mid uh, mid to late nineties where you know sound chips were becoming much more sophisticated, CD quality, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Where you started to have the inclusion of real recorded orchestras, and I started to take notice of these things. Um, there were two games in particular that really struck me um, as, as a gamer. This is, you know, this isn't. This is way before I'm even thinking about game audio or combining the two things. But certainly, Final Fantasy VII blew me away. That's my one of my favorite games of all time, and that soundtrack, the Uematsu soundtrack, is just beautiful. Yeah, I think that's there's it. just nothing wrong about that soundtrack. It's so dark, <laughs> so beautiful, so poetic, and. That's what kind of really drove me towards character themes. And I was thinking, oh, every character has a specific sound here. There's, there's an instrumentation surrounding that, that portrayal of that character. And that, that, that's something I took notice of. And also the, um, the inclusion of Ave Maria in the Hitman series. That was also something that really struck me too. Because those two things are such a kind of clash, yeah. such a contrast. You've got this kind of, you know, Hitman for money killing people in horrible ways and then you've got this beautiful beautiful piece of music yeah but i love that that idea of the the kind of the, the the poetic nature of the perfect kill um and i think that's what they were probably sort of going for that's what i took from it anyway yeah so it was around about that point where i started to take notice more of games not just for the enjoyment of them but for the for the you know the audio impact they could have but again much later it wasn't until i was sandwiched between the second and third year of university where i was starting to think right okay what i want to do with this music degree what you know everyone was going into teaching it was a very much a teacher's degree Mm. um but i was always fascinated in composition and being creative and doing those sorts of things and i was thinking well what are my interests now I, i didn't really play sport anymore um so it was music and games i was like right okay what if I combine those two? What if I start doing a bit of research into that? And I was thinking, well, how, how do you meet people that make games? I, I'd never met a game developer before. I didn't know where you had to kind of dig, dig up to find one. Um, and you do have luckily, to dig, up, dig them up, don't you? <laughs> you have to kind of dig. Um, uh, but that, luckily for me, I was studying Plymouth at Plymouth University, and there was an arts college nearby that did do, um, I can't remember if it was a you know, computer science or game programming degree, but it's, there was certainly at least a module in game design or something like that. And I met a guy called Johnny Vigers who was um, uh, wanting some audio for this kind of demo that he was putting together. All I knew is that I had a really beat up computer. This is my Cubase 3 <laughs> NAF looking PC. Yeah. And I knew I could put some tracks together. So it was during those really early formative years that I learned about looping and you know making sure things were kind of just created properly so that there wasn't a great deal of ear fatigue. Do you know what I mean? You had to Mm. kind of create music differently in that respect. There isn't a a definitive start and end. Um, And this is, you know, this is, I'm like 23 at this point. So it's quite late on. But yeah, but the more more I kind of learnt about it and the more I played games then and started to take even more notice of of game audio, I was thinking, yeah, this is cool. I, I, I like this and I was enjoying it. So then when it comes to, came to leaving university, I said, like, right, how do I find more developer? How, how, do, I de- how do I develop a, a portfolio of work, of projects that I can then you know, build a craft around? Um, and luckily for me, around about that time, the, the game industry was going through a split. So we had the crash of 2008, right? Mm-hmm. And so many, so many developers and studios were closing down and people losing their jobs and it was horrible. But of course, it, it splintered away and, and created this, this indie industry, this sub-industry within the industry. So you had lots more indie, smaller studios setting up more innovative uh, or developing more in- innovative ideas and taking more risks. Um, and this was all happening just as I'd graduated. So I was like, right, okay, there seems to be a buzz about this. I'm going to get involved and talk to people and go to some local events. And Bristol um, has, has quite a, it's quite a small, dedicated game dev scene, but it's very 
it's, it's exactly that. It's dedicated and there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of cool stuff happening in Bristol. It's a very arty uh, city anyway. I love yeah. Bristol. Um, yeah, Brist Bristol's a lovely place, lovely yeah. place. Um, so I kind of lucked out that this was happening round about the time that I was looking for stuff. But it wasn't until I started getting involved in community radio. That was probably the first thing I did after moving back to Bristol was get involved in community radio, did a video game, VGM Awesome, a video game music show. Oh. And and we just, you know, just fizzed about game music and soundtracks and we did quirky little things. We even ran a couple of game jams ourselves. Um, and then uh, on the show, we, we were always looking for local devs to come on and talk about stuff. And we started talking to a guy called Thomas Rawlings, who at the time was setting up a studio called Red, Red Wasp Design in Bristol. He came on and was talking about this uh, a Cthulhu-based game um, that he had produced. And got chatting to him and I still work with him now um, yeah. and he now runs a studio called Auric Digital in Bristol which is a fundamentally just a, a brilliant studio um, and it's really quite it's grown quite a bit in the last um, five six years um, so yeah it was, it was it was kind of down to pure chance but I don't really believe in that I think you have to make your own luck you put yourself in a circle in a, or in a scenario where there's things happening yeah. and you do develop your own ties do you know what I mean? You have to kind of create those opportunities for you, and that's that's what happened. Do you think uh, going to university really helped you with that networking? Uh, no, not at all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. No, I mean, I've thought about this a lot, and for me, the only thing I really took from university was um, the ideas that I developed around composition. I, I did very well at composition, and that took me by surprise because I didn't go there with a specific idea surrounding composition. Like that was never really the draw. I just wanted to learn more about music because as I say, up to that point, it was always just a hobby. Um, and I was surrounded by people that were, you know, grade eight pianists, viola players, dr you know, amazing drummers, guitarists. And I felt so intimidated. I was just like this little boy from Bristol who had a thing for piano and, <laughs> and pop songs. And I was thinking, oh man, I am, I am so deep in this right now. Yeah. But you realize that people aren't quite as intimidating and, and you get to know them and you start working with them and, and start to kind of learn a bit and you develop that confidence. Um, but yeah, no, sorry. The, the only thing I really took from, from my degree was the, the ideas around composition. I, I kind of really grew towards that. I, I developed a lot of confidence that I could create something from nothing. Um, and we had a one, one, uh, lecturer in particular, a guy called Sam Richards, who's very much into experimental music, um, Sun Ra and John Cage and <laughs> Cornelius Cardew and all these kind of people. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I remember one lecture he brought in, oh man, like somewhere between 75 and 100 uh, toys, like cheap kids' toys. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, right, we're going to create a musical piece using only this as an ensemble. And we just kind of, I was, cool. I was really up for it because yeah. I was kind of a bit of a, outside the box way of think uh, way of thinking but all the you know more regimented classical players were like this is not music what are we doing <laughs> you know and i was like no come on come on let's let's have a go let's try it um and yeah i mean it sounded almost terrible but it was the, it was the fact that it forces you to be resourceful yeah and you've you've got some very clear boundaries and th so that's my point sorry is that that was also something i took away was the ability to be resourceful and to work within limits because that's exactly what game audio is yeah it's just limitations after limitations and you have to absolutely do your best to max that out um yeah. so yeah those were the things that i really took from that degree everything else was kind of you know gray yeah <laughs> that's good i think that's good for people to hear as well because the thing you always hear people say is like go to uni because you network and you know you'll meet people but it's as you said it's not necessarily the case the no. the you know, the learning is the thing that you should get from university and then yeah. networking comes second. Yeah, it does. And learning continues even now. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing okay in my career now. Um, but if my thirst for learning stops, then I've, I've got a real problem my, on my hands because developers are constantly innovating, constantly evolving the way they do things and coming up with new, cooler, bigger, better ideas. Um, and if I don't keep pace with that, then I'll find someone else who will. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a necessary pressure that I keep telling myself that keep learning, keep keep you know expanding and getting better. Absolutely. Um, and, and at some point you're just, you're kind of look down or look behind on on the past person that you were, and you think, whoa, I've actually learned quite a bit here. 
and I'm working on some cool stuff now. And you know, and you think, whoa, where did that come from? But it just comes from showing a lot of energy and perseverance and confidence in yourself that you can be that person that you want to be. <laughs> cool. Uh, so you have got a very broad portfolio. So having a look at your website, you've got music designer, sound designer, vocalist, and film composer, and obviously game audio. How do you balance all of that? And also, how did you... Do you think it's better to focus on just one thing? Like, someone wants to become a sound designer, they should focus on that, or should they sort of take the route of try everything? Um, I think in this, in this day and age, I don't think there's any real discipline that is quite so one-dimensional as that. I think if you were just a composer, hmm. you know, e e you have to diversify even just within that discipline. You know, you look at classical composers or film composers, they're starting to kind of bleed into games now. Yeah. And that's been going on for quite some time because it's another, it's another workflow and it's, it's another way of learning. It's another network and it's another, f another um, form of income if you can kind of manage that with film work. Um, so I've always believed in... in diversifying to a point where I'm not thinly spread. If I feel as though I'm doing too many things and I can't do any one of those things well, then I'm pushing it too far. Yeah. You know, what's that line? I don't know what film it's from. Um, too much butter over not enough bread. I think it's from The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings <laughs> or something. I think Bilbo Baggins says it. Oh, yeah, when he's been wearing the ring too long. And yeah, he feels says. like he's thinly spread. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the balance. You have to, you have to kind of expand and, and create a stream uh, of work, working flow um, that is attractive. But it's all relatable. So when I entered the games industry, I was just a composer. Didn't call myself a music designer. I didn't even really know what that was at the moment. Which, by the way, I'm, I'm convinced I penned that title. <laughs> and now everyone uses it. I'm convinced I was the first one to start saying that. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, but it's all relatable. So you take one project, take one, take um, Dark Future, which comes out um, next week. At the time of recording this, comes out next week on the sixteenth of May. Nice. So just within that project alone, so I've I've been music designer, sound designer, um, sound recordist, co-presenter to the podcast linked to that game within the studio too. So you you have to kind of, you know, just build an arsenal of things that you can do. But again, just without spreading yourself too thin. Yeah, kind of pick the things that you're the strongest at. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you enjoy and get better at them. That's that's right. I think um, I, I would never introduce anything onto my website that I didn't think I could fulfil. So right. my website's actually going through a redesign at the moment. Um, I've had that design there for about three years, and it's getting a bit old, a bit tiresome to look at. So that one of the newer nice. things, there's two brand new things that will be introduced, and that there's the sound recorders, so doing a lot of boom work for films, because I started in film, really. Okay. Alongside community radio work, I was doing a lot of short films. Um, I knew more filmmakers than I did game developers at the time, so I started just doing stuff like that. Um, and then when I felt more comfortable as a sound designer and as a sound recorder, I was thinking, right, okay, I think I can start tapping into film work again and doing sound recorder stuff. Um, and I've only been doing that for uh, about 18 months or two years, but that's been really, really cool. And it's been, it's been quite interesting because it's that same feeling that I had when I started playing the piano for the first time. It just took to it really well. Yeah. It just took to being able to know where best to get a good mic position and how to c conduct yourself on a film set. I really enjoyed it. Plus also, it's nice to get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely. nice to get out of the studio. You know, when you're working on a game um, or, or, or mo many projects, you're, you're very much dedicated to one place and sitting in the same chair, and that's fine. But um, going out into the field, being outside, and just uh, interacting with people on a slightly larger scale all in one place, yeah. that was a big draw. And yeah. that's why I felt quite, quite compelled to sort of start tapping into that, really. The... Um the the energy on a film set's very good, isn't it? I've worked on a couple of yeah. film sets and that I like I like how regimented yet kind of well, yeah, as I said, it's all team based, isn't it? It's everyone's in it to do one have one goal. And mm. uh yeah, yeah, I really like that. And you've got to have nice yeah. nice strong arms to hold up that boom arm. <laughs> yeah. You do, and I I'm not the biggest guy. As I say, I, I think this is where where with my jock background, I'm I'm quite a physically fit person, but I'm certainly not uh, a broad person. Yeah. I, I'm the sort of guy that runs a marathon, like a, that kind of lean sort of build. Um, but uh, yeah, so that when when there's a take that might be I don't know longer than a couple of minutes, hopefully you won't hear that kind of th this 
this sort of sound <laughs> tapping into the mic when because I'm shaking the boom. Yeah. But um, yeah. But, but again, that's that's just a challenge that comes with being a boom operator. So that's something I'm going to get better at and get stronger and and be able to deal with. You know. Cool. Um, the music designer uh, saying you penned that. Can you explain what a music <laughs> designer is? Well, this I think in. In games, there's a lot. There's a bigger um, idea around design. Right. So you know, if you're composing music, you know, um, certainly if you're implementing those tracks as well, and you're doing sound design alongside it, you're thinking about um, the composition is more of a design uh, experience for me. Mm. So I think if you're if you're doing a lot on the inside of a game within an engine, there's more of a design idea behind the music as opposed to just composition. So music design just seems a more appropriate title for that. Um, so yeah, that, that's my kind of idea. I, I'm, I'm sure I probably didn't pen that, but I started <laughs> calling myself that thinking, well, I'm not really, I'm composing music, but it doesn't feel like I'm a composer. So I'm going to come up with this new title. And all of a sudden, maybe six months later, I was going to network meets and game dev meets and then, uh, everyone's calling themselves a music designer. I'm like, what? <laughs> hey, I should have stuck a patent on that or yeah. something. <laughs> I want some coin for that, please. <laughs> yeah. I'd like some Bitcoin or something. <laughs> Are there any skills uh, from all of those that cross over? Oh, that was in reference more to the, between film and games. So I think it was talking about like music specifically. But is there anything, yeah, between films and games that kind of cross over? Well, yeah. I mean, of course it does. I mean, so you you can still be just a straight composer and work in work in the game industry. It just that would tend to be a case of. Um, if you're just a composer, that's fine. You can be a great composer, but you're only going to get composition work. Yeah. Um, but if you're sound design and you're music design and you're implementing um, and sound recording as well, these are all things that are definitely going to get used within a within a game dev. Yeah, and it's much easier for them to just come to one place and go, oh, awesome, we've got everything that we need. Yeah, I think trust is a big a big thing. You know, yeah. when especially when it gets to a, a, a crunch and you're working, maybe a, a development studio lands a big IP um, with a big publisher or something. You know, there's a lot of pressure that surrounds that. Of course, they want it to be their best work, so. It, if you've got a tried and tested collaborator who they've worked with in the past, um, it, it kind of goes without saying they're going to go to that person because they trust the workflow. That person understands how the studio works. They understand what their what their system is and how it kind of goes about itself. Um, trust is a big deal. And I think when you're starting out, that's that's the real challenge. You know that you can produce audio and you know that you can compose music, but the developers don't know that. Yeah. So how do you convince them that you're good for it and then they give you a, sh give you a shout when, when they need some audio? And that's where perseverance is key. Just work on stuff and you, you eventually build up a, a portfolio um, of things that you've done and you will get that chance. You just need to persevere. Because the people that don't persevere, they'll just sort of fade away and then you're left with the person who really, really wants it. Absolutely. And that, I think, that when I started that, that's the one thing I knew I had. I had a lot of dedication. I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm just going to... The first thing I know I'm going to beat the other competition off with is my patience. <laughs> I'll just hang around. Yeah. Um, you know, I would just wait and just talk and build my own client base and not think too much about... Comp uh, not composition, sorry. Competition. Yeah. Um, I think if you, if you compete and you try to... If you kind of think like, well, I need to get more work than that person... I, for me, that's never been a, a proactive approach, really. I focus purely on myself. The only person I'm at competition with is me. I don't think about other other game developer, sorry, game audio people within Bristol or anything like that. I just focus on what I'm good at. I focus on my own black book of clients, and that is it. Um, because it's a much nicer way. I prefer working that way. Um, and the relationships feel, they feel, feel nice and fuzzy, and I like that. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a bit about your approach to composition? So say somebody uh, comes to you with, say, hey, I want you to make some music. Where, where do you start with that? Do they, if it's a game, um, would you ask for some like artwork or to see a mm. video or something? Or do you talk to the developers? I'm just wondering uh, how yeah. early they bring you on in a game as well. Yeah, I think um, the earlier you can get on, on side of a project, the better because you've just got more time to, to digest all the, all the things. And quite often the cases, certainly that I've found, you're, you might enter a project and there's lore and there's backstory and all the developers know everything, anything and everything about what you're about to produce, but you're yeah. coming in slightly cold. You can't be 
uh, a specialist in everything. So you have to kind of learn these things quickly and get to know what it means and, and, and the law that surrounds it. The, the law is really cool. So this is one in fact the Nazis were interested in the occult and they were conducting experiments and, and all these kind of things to produce, you know, super soldiers or something. Wow. Um, and the idea around this game is that, well, what if that, was, what if that were true? What if they did harness something? And then they used that as a weapon against the Allied nations. Do you know mm, what I mean? Yeah. So it's set within this kind of secret war, and it's based on a tabletop game by Modiphius, Acton Cthulhu. Um, so with that, you know, I'd, I'd never worked on a Cthulhu-based property before, so I had to get to know the enemy types and the idea around this secret war that was going on. Um, but the, the most important thing is is to have that dialogue, to have that conversation, just to kind of get an idea for the flavors that the, the, the developers are thinking about. So that game in particular was, it's a World War II strategy game. So the first thing I thought was like Medal of Honor. I love that Medal of Honor sound. Like Michael Giacchino's yeah. soundtrack to uh, Frontline. Medal of Honor Frontline is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Operation Market Garden. Wow, it's a beautiful piece of music. Cool. Um, and so I was thinking, right, that I need that sound, but you've got like horrible, disgusting enemies, this kind of ethereal, um, uneasy ambience to it. So it had to be very mysterious and, and, and dark and, you know. So I had to kind of splice those two things together and create something that felt right. And we came up with something that was really cool and, and, it, and it seemed to work well with, with what we'd produced. Um, so going back to the composition, the actual mm. composition, for me, it will start anywhere. Once I've, once I've established the idea so again, take Acton Cthulhu, for example. I knew the two things I had to combine. Yeah. And then and it's at that point where I'll then do nothing. I'll just literally, I wouldn't even try to write anything because it would just come out wrong because I haven't, I haven't digested it yet. You know, I need, I've, I've grown more in confidence to just allow ideas to cook away in the back of my brain and just let them simmer. And eventually something comes through. And... Um, and that comes when I'm doing the most boring of tasks. I might be washing up. I might be, you know, in the shower. You know, when I'm, when I'm at a point where I'm not thinking about work, yeah. that is always when the ideas come through. It's happened time and time and time again. And I've really grown to develop that muscle yeah. and that confidence in it. So with Acton Cthulhu, the first thing that I did was, um, I think it was just, it was, it was a baseline by... Um, by like cellos or, or basses. And that became the basis for um, the Shogoth battle theme. So I'm, I'm a piano player, so I'm always thinking about the body of a piece, not necessarily melody, but I'll always think about the overall body of, of what it is, because it's such a broad instrument. That's yeah. how I would always kind of approach it. Um, so I ended up just with this really cool kind of, you know, yeah. and then, and that becomes a piece of music very quickly because you've got something that's driving it. It becomes the backbone, yeah? yeah? Yeah. And then from that one piece of music, you're like, oh, right, okay. So now I've got a piece of music set within this universe. And then you start to pick out ideas that then bleed into other cues. So I needed, I needed something for a menu. I needed a title theme. I needed like a game over, all these kind of things. And you just start to pick ideas that seem to work. But that, that all sounds quite systematic and quite regimented but in the next project it'll be utterly different i just i won't necessarily start there because every project just presents a whole new different um a, a, again a different law a different a different idea yeah when, um, when the idea does come do you do you put it straight into the door or do you write it out in um notation first because i know uh, quite a few composers like to do it in sibelius mm. and then they get their ideas kind of visual yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I mean, firstly, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not fluent with with notation. I was as a child, um, but ha I've, it's been so many years where I haven't done it. I can understand notation, but I don't read it fluently anymore. Yeah, um, it takes me a while to kind of really wrap my brain. So I'm, my my thinking is that well, that's going to take that's time for me to do that. Yeah. So, and that's not really my practice anymore. Um, but I've got a bit of a test. So if again, if I'm out doing very normal things. Um, if I if I have an idea, um, and again, it might be a bass line, it might be a melody, it might be an idea around percussion or something, um, I'll just record that. Um, and there's two things that I'll do. If, if that still, you know, gives gives me goosebumps the next day, and I think, yeah, that's an idea then, then I'll start to develop it. So it always has a 24-hour test. Ah, the, like some, of, some of the best ideas that I've ever had, uh, and this is true for Dark Future as well, um, 
if if I'm feeling confident, I won't record it. I always have a little micro kit with me. I, I've always got a, a field recorder on me or, or even on my phone or something. Um, but I, if, I, if I'm feeling confident, feeling slightly fruity, I won't bother to record it. Because then the next day, if it's still there and I can, and I can hum it out and I can sing it to myself, then I know it's a good one. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's, it's become an earworm already. And I'm thinking, yeah. right, yeah, that's something worth developing. And, and again, that's something that I've done time and time again. And some of my better ideas have come from that way of working. I'm not saying that is the best approach for every music designer or composer because everyone has their own ways of doing things. But that's something that's worked for me. And it's something I still do now. Yeah, I like that approach. Yeah, me too. How do you visualize? Um, do you visualize your songs in your head? I said you said that you're not familiar with notation. Do you do you see yourself playing the instrument and where those notes, where your hands would be on on the, your piano, for example? Uh, for example. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think you. I'm quite a visual person. Yeah. Any any music I produce outside of a project, always, almost always. Uh, tends to be more experimental, so it's more soundscape-based, because it's a way of expression, right? So um, I'm a very visual sort of thinker, and I will always kind of look at a piece and think, well, where are the colours? Where are the colours in this piece? You know, what's, what's dancing around my piano? What needs emphasis at any given point? Yeah. Um, and then it becomes a case of... <laughs> it largely becomes a case of stripping away all the stuff that I've thrown at the sequencer, because it's always too <laughs> much. And you have to kind of get better at um, just the arrangement. It's very easy to throw ideas down and think, oh, it needs more, it needs more of this, it needs more of that. But much like mixing, it's like if you're about, it's about stripping away the frequencies instead of adding stuff all the time because then it becomes really muddy. And the idea, the really good idea that you might have had is covered up by all these other things that you're trying to make work. Sometimes simplicity is complexity. And... Yeah that's something I, st I stick by quite a lot you know simple ideas will inevitably become complex so don't make them complex because complex on top of complex is really complex and that's really difficult to <laughs> work too with much. yeah it's, it's too much complex um so keep it simple keep it really simple and just allow those things to grow because your brain will inevitably want to make them articulate and decorated and, and fancy anyway so start simple I'm not sure what the question was at the start of that, but um, you know, we you've gone all philosophical again. Yeah, I <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a bit like that. I mean, we can joke about that, but that's certainly in the last, certainly since becoming a father, um, that's a big deal for me because everything's very, very different now. So my my music is different and my workflow is different um, because my days are, are are managed with a young child too. Um, so my way of thinking is very kind of meditative and very kind of tranquil, or at least it tries to be because I, I have to kind of maintain my mindset to get any really good work done in the limited hours that I have yeah. during the working day. Cause I don't, I do my absolute best to not work into the evenings and certainly not on weekends. So you guys are really lucky that I'm doing this for you on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very um, much. Mate. <laughs> you're okay. You're okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I do my best to keep to a, you know, to a sort of half eight, six p.m. sort of working day. Um, I think that, I yeah, think, I yeah. think that's good, actually, because it leads on to the question of how do you structure your working day? Like yeah. uh, from beginning to end, Monday to Friday, how are you working? Are you kind of very relaxed with it? You said you don't like you kind of you let your brain do the work while you're doing other stuff. Or mm. do you know what I mean? Or do you have a yeah. set time where you go, right, it's 12 o'clock. I'm going to sit down. I've got two hours. I'm going to write something. Yeah. I have a plan. Of course, in composition, you can't always say, right, I've got four hours, I'm going to compose a piece of music in four hours. Yeah. Because it doesn't often work like that. It's a very abstract thing. Sometimes you could spend six hours doing something and it's absolute rubbish. Yeah. You might spend 20 minutes doing something yeah. and it's the best thing since Cathedral Cheese. <laughs> like it's, you know, you know how that works, right? Yeah. It's, it's a very hit and miss kind of, kind of experience. Absolutely. But in, in terms of my working day and certainly with the way things are now, so... Um, our little boy will always wake up around about 6, 6.15. Um, I'm training for a marathon at the moment, so I go out and hit the road for a couple of miles um, at 7 a.m. I'll we'll do a little run, and that becomes my little, my little meditation thing in the morning. I, yeah. I go out for a little run, I come back. Do you listen um, to anything when you're on your run? No, I don't, actually, and that's with good reason, because I've, I've tried that. If I go for a run and listen to music... Your, your musical brain is, is analysing stuff yeah. and you're thinking about work and that's not the point for me. So I, I choose 
I absolutely choose to run cold with nothing in my in my head um, and allow myself to just kind of focus and think about the things I need to think about without being interrupted, it feels like, by music, which is kind of weird as a, a music professional. Yeah. Um, but that's just the way it seems to work for me. Um, so, yeah, so the first kind of hour and a half, two hours of the day, normally are just uh, set with admin tasks. So I'll, I might have a, an update for my website. I might do a blog post. I'll do some social media stuff. Um, emails, messages. So I'll do all that kind of stuff first. Uh, and then that'll be it until the end of the day. And then 10 o'clock, I tend to stop project work. Um, I try my best not to work on two separate projects during the same day because you're changing mindsets. And I prefer to just be like, right, this day, Tuesday, I'm doing that. And just all day I can be in that hat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that works really, really well for me just because I've, I can see the colors that I have to work with that day. Um, and that would just go on until about five o'clock, half past five, where I, I start to kind of peter off around about four and it becomes a bit of a slugfest after that. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, around about five, five thirty, I'll then do uh, emails. So I bookend my day with emails. Um, I do not answer emails during the day. I do my best not to, because again, it just takes you out of that mindset of, yeah. of trying to be focused. Um, and then that's it. And then six o'clock is bath time for my little boy. So then it becomes an evening of, of, of being a dad and being a family man. Um, and this, this is a relatively new thing. You, you, again, you're lucky. This is the first time I'm really talking about it, to be honest, because <laughs> he's only eight months old. So I'd gotten so very used to doing things and having almost all the hours in, on the earth to do stuff. Yeah. When you become a dad, those things become quite limited and, uh, going back to Thomas Rawlings, I asked him um, when we uh, realized we were pregnant that how do you manage? Because he's got some s small children. I said, how do you manage your time with little people? And he's just like, well, it's just moderation. You just have to be really, really organized. And I was like, thanks, Tom. That is good advice. Like, you just need to hear it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you just need to, by the hour, just be like, right, this is what I'm doing. I'll always prep the coming week's work on the weekend. So that's kind of the only bit of work I really do on the weekend. So a Sunday night, I just look at my diary and go, right, what's due? What's, pr what's priority? Um, what do I want to do? And that process kind of copy pastes from Monday to Thursday. Friday is a little bit more chilled because it's a Friday. Um, so the morning, I tend to be a bit more kind of chilled out. I'll, I'll probably do more social media stuff because I quite enjoy that. I quite enjoy trying to create content and sharing things and talking about stuff that you're, that you're doing because it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then if, if I need to work on a project because there's a deadline or something, then I will. But I, on a Friday, I try to work on side projects. So I'm, I've got an album, I want to say an album, an EP. It's a two-part album into two EPs that are coming out soon called Wormhole, which is quite a cool idea. And I've been doing that um, every Friday for the last, say, four or five weeks, which has been a lot of fun because, again, it's, it's a nice relief from... Uh, from project work, you know, you, you get very used to um, to working on these things, and it's very good. It's very healthy, I find, to have those side projects to experiment and to apply what you've learned on the professional projects, and then to do something kind of maybe outrageous with in a side project. And it's really, it's a really good way of expressing yourself. Yeah, and it's something um, for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And because there's no brief, there's no brief, there's no deadline which is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because you should put a deadline on things, otherwise they'll never get finished. <laughs> you have to, because we've all been there. You think you've got this great idea and you think, well, I, I'm not going to put a time frame on it, but I found it's good to do that. Even if you give yourself six months, at least you know that, right, in six months, this is going to be out and it's going to be on Spotify or iTunes or whatever. You know, then you can move on to the next thing because if you don't, yeah it'll just become really thin and it becomes, for me, it, it, it might become a chore and that's, again, not a good place to be working if you feel like something is, is work. No. It, it, you know, if it becomes a drag like that, then you need to change your approach um, because that's unenjoyable and, and life is not to be not enjoyed. Yeah. You know, we, we should all be doing things we enjoy doing. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the other questions I was going to ask is how do you know when, when a piece is finished? Is it you've given yourself this time frame, whether it's... Um, something you're doing yourself or whether it's uh, for a um, game. But how do you know when this piece is finished? Because I always feel like oh, I could just do a little bit more or I could just add something there yeah. and tweak that bit. I guess the, the answer is you, you never really know. And, and, and it's never finished. Are, is art ever finished? I think that's a question that's been um, asked time and time again. 
um, certainly on a project, it's finished when the deadline is is there and you have yeah. to deliver. That's when it's finished. Um, but on side projects, yeah, that's a bit more of a challenge because you, you do have the option to go back to it and go back to it again. But my, my take is I try to release four um, pieces of work, side project work, a year, so one a quarter. So in the first quarter of this year, I released a, an album called Drones for Coders, which is quite a cool soundtrack, um, or soundscape rather. Um, and that was very much a love letter to game development. So the idea is that someone walks into the office, they log in, headphones go on, and then they, get, they enter this world where they're coding and they enter this world of colors and vibrant things. And at the end of it, the headphones come off and he leaves the office. And it's bookended by, by those two exact things. Um, and that was like my love letter to all the, the game devs that I've worked in, um, I worked with, sorry, over the last sort of 10 years. Um, side projects wise, yeah, you, ju- you just have to give yourself something. And then and if, you wanna, if you wanna go back, then you go back and do a remix or something. But just give yourself a deadline, otherwise it just never come out. Yeah, um, that's what I find. You just so one a quarter seems to work for me. Yeah, it's good. I am absolutely a victim of procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? In yeah. this day and age, it's so difficult to remain focused. I think that's why um, things like mindfulness have become really popular. Yeah, because absolutely. we're bombarded with information, um, and even if you're not trying, there's a new, f- there's a Twitter feed, there's something's trending, there's you know all these algorithms and and, and things are just chucking stuff at you because you watched that last video yeah, yeah. and they're and trying to like, make you interact with it as well so a lot of the time yeah. the algorithm gives you quite um stuff that you might not actually like but that you have oh you're really angry about that maybe because they just want mm. you to interact and then you end up interacting and then yeah you're, then that's that hour gone you're going oh what have i done exactly and the spiral <laughs> goes on and on and on you get yeah. caught in this trap so, you know, we're all there. And I think social media and uh, YouTube and sharing, all the rest of it, it's a relatively new beast. But I think um, 10 or so years on from where these things first uh, came about, new ways and practices are being put in place to kind of counter that a little bit. Not, not to kind of completely eliminate and eradicate it, but just to be more managed with it. Yeah. So, so going back to mindfulness, yeah, that that's a big deal for me. I I, I really enjoy doing things like that because it allows me to kind of keep zen, um, and focus on what I need to do and just just ignore all the fluff that comes from logging into my Twitter account. Do you use any mindfulness apps? That's the exact question I was about yes! to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have I have done I have done, but um um I've I've been I've been, I've been an active pr- practicing um, agent of of mindfulness for about two years now um and the apps don't really work for me being completely honest they're really really good nothing against them i think they're really really good and they'll work for other people but i i I don't sit down every morning and 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 meditate like you'd stereotypically think it to go about so like for example i go for a run that is my time to be mindful and to meditate and just kind of to get zen Lots of people say um, that they use their runs as their meditation time. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's the, the great thing about it, the reason it's really, really useful um, and very popular is because it can be used anywhere. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. Of course, don't do it when you're on the motorway going 70 miles an hour. <laughs> that, that might be really bad. It's time to um, pull over and have a little run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pull into the, into the smell slowly at least. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that can be applied to any part of your day and it's free. It's just about stopping and doing things a little bit slower and not allowing um, social media and that kind of drive to kick you in the ass and say, you need to do this. And, oh, so-and-so's comment on that. Oh, what, what do you think about this? Just even thinking about it gets me slightly riled up. It's like, <laughs> just slow it down. Just be your own person. Think about what you want to do and ignore all of that jazz, man. It's just not necessary a yeah. lot of the time i mean so, I, I deleted yeah. facebook from my phone for that exact reason of just yeah. just uh, don't uh, shut up everyone <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think you know these are great tools um social media accounts and twitter and and all these things that they're all wonderful things and they should be used because they're very effective I've, I've 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 grabbed loads of work just from creating a twitter um um dialogue with someone yeah you know so that you cannot You cannot ignore how powerful they can be, but you need to take control of them, not the other way around. Otherwise, it's just, you might as well just, you know, punch yourself in the face all day because that's what it is. (laughs) Yeah. All these things, it's like hashtag, 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 hashtag. Just, oh gosh, just no, just ignore it and just focus (laughs) on what you need to do. Yeah. 
I mean, I've got a bloodied nose just from punching myself <laughs> in the face too much. I think one of the most yeah. mindful things I've tried um, was a float tank. Ooh. That, oh, wow. Have you ever tried one of those? No, no. That was very interesting because it's just you. There's no sound. There's no. There's nothing at all. So mm. the water's meant to be the same temperature as your body, so you don't feel the water. It's full yeah. of salt, and so you're just floating there, pitch black. And, yeah, you have about an hour session in there, and yeah. your brain just goes off. You can't tell if you're awake, if you're asleep. So the actual, <laughs> when you're in there, is very weird. And I think there was some sort of weird hallucinations and, you know, lights flying around. That was your fault, though. You took LSD before I you went in there. didn't. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it was more when I came out of it, it was the most relaxed I've been in like 10 years it was crazy i just mm. i took a little video of myself just trying to talk because i was so just oh nothing nothing matters it's just it's just now that's it and that was it's really true nice. it's true i i, I think I, I didn't expect this this interview to become quite so philosophical like <laughs> you this, did but, it um, you've done it <laughs> I, I know i i done it but um but it's I mean, again, we joke about it, but it's really important. And the yeah, reason yeah. I've, I've found a real draw with that is because it's, it helps me to work. It helps me to be more approachable. Um, I'm quite a likable guy anyway, but yeah. like, it, it just allows me to develop a way of thinking that is effective. It allows me to think clear, clearer, um, and I will continue probably to do it for the rest of my life now because it's just, just take a step back, ignore all the fluff. You know, yeah. and you can see clearer. You can see the clarity in things when you're not being bombarded with unnecessary fluff. Yeah, and I think going on in the future, there's only going to be more bombardment. There's going to be more advertising, more yeah. notifications on your phone, and then it's it's a matter of time until um, social media apps are augmented into our bodies. It's yes. like I've I've talked with friends and and certainly game devs love talking about this kind of stuff. My my family and friends aren't aren't necessarily uh, uh, creative, in, certainly in a musical sense. Um, and they don't necessarily think the way that I think. But I've been asked quite a few times, like, what's, what's next? Or where's it going to go? You know, where's it going to go? Mm. And I'm convinced this human augmentation, deus ex, that's going to happen. It's going to so. happen. Like, you look at bionic arms and things like that now, Google Glass. Yeah. It's, hap it's happening. Fast forward 50 years, can you imagine what things are going to be like. And that's going to happen in our lifetime. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I mean, it's, we're both... We're going to see some incredible things, I think. We're both massive incredible VR things. enthusiasts. And <laughs> right, right. That, that, being in that world, the first time I stepped in that world was like, Crazy. oh my God, this is it. Yeah. This is what I've been wanting my whole life. <laughs> and, and then it's just, it's just progressing and progressing. Like the new, uh, the new Oculus Quest is wireless. You can take that wherever you want and become inside a virtual world wherever you yeah. are. And that's only going to get more complicated and more immersive mm. the more time goes on so yeah we're gonna we're gonna start ignoring the real world i think <laughs> well, well there's a great there's a great scene i i unfortunately didn't think too much of the film I, I really enjoyed the book but ready player one is an incredible book and when i saw the film i thought ah, it's kind of fun it's kind of cool um but it wasn't as uh, as kind of um what's the word well philosophical i guess it, it didn't really hit me with too many messages uh, it tried to, it, I think it, it tried to towards the end, but kind of, it was a bit loose. But there's a great panning shot where, I, I don't know, the, the characters might be in a van and they're driving along this road. And it's, this is in the real world. And they just drive past loads of people and they've all got their headsets on. And they just, it's like a zombie epidemic almost. They're just yeah, kind of yep. there staring up at this, this oasis, this world. And even in its, in its infancy, that is happening now. Like you go, to, you walk down the street, you walk past a bus stop, everyone's just mindlessly looking at their phones, like not interacting, just swiping their thumbs. Yeah. And when I see that, I'm like, guys, look up. It, oh, like yeah. It's a beautiful day. Like there's so much stuff going on. But, the, but then again, to do that. in contrast to that, do you think, you know, you take away those phones, do you think those people are going to interact with each other? Well, that's the argument, you know. I, maybe, maybe that, that's that's something I'm fantasizing about. Um, but I do my best. I, I, I genuinely do my best. If I'm out, um, I'm out with friends at a bar, a restaurant, or anything like that, um, and someone serves me, I'll, I'll make an effort to get like learn their name. Yeah. Um, or just, you know, instead of being like, yeah, cheers, thanks. Yeah. It's, it's like, no, thanks for that. It was really cool. You know, you having a good night. What's going on? Just, just. Some people might be like, oh, what a weirdo. Why is he asking me these questions? <laughs> But, but I think that's the thing. We're becoming so numb to kind of human interaction. And each yeah. generation is going to become even number. Yeah. You know, they're not going to kind of quite grasp it as maybe we did in growing up in the 80s or something. Um, it's, 
it, it's a, it's a skill that is getting thinner and thinner with each generation I find and you know I'm just going to do my bit just to certainly teach my son that you know he's he's never going to be um denied technology because it's a way of life now if, yeah. if we don't introduce that to him then he'll surely fall behind the other kids around his age or his peers so will he, introduce it to him anyway well, yeah exactly and and, th- and then you lose the power i want to be able to introduce it to him yeah. on our grounds you know yeah, yeah, yeah um so you know but but i also want him to be social you know and to understand the delicacies delicacies that come with talking to people and saying thank you showing gratitude and just being a nice guy yeah. So, who are some of the so uh, composers or artists or anyone um, in the industry at all? Like, who has been influential yeah. for you? Yeah, I've got a few, and I, I have made a list here. Um, so we we spoke briefly about Nobu Imatsu. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. man, I would love to meet that guy and just shake his hand and say thank you. Thank I think you that's so on much. a lot of people's lists. Yeah, yeah. I think actually he's he's poorly. The last oh, no. I heard, he was poorly. Mm. Um, and he, I think he's in his you know mid sixties or something, um, early mid sixties. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but yeah, he, I think he's poorly, so get well soon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his two themes in particular in Final Fantasy VII, Ares and uh, Sephiroth's theme, yeah. One Winged Angel, like it's it's a creative powerhouse, that piece. Dun, 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 dun. Du, 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 du. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah. so outrageous. And I especially love the, um, uh, I think his band was called the Black Mages and they performed it as part of the Distant Worlds concert where... There's like a, a like a heavy metal section. If cool. you haven't heard this, it, it's One Winged Angel live, but with the Black Mages, and you've got Uematsu playing on organ as well. And I'll have to link you guys to it if you've not seen it already. But there's there's a section in in between uh, normally where there's like an orchestral kind of swell, and but they kind of ignore that and just throw in this really. And it's really cool, and you're like, oh my gosh, what a contrast! And then it goes back to that bit where it goes. And it goes back into that, and you're like, "Whoa, where did that come from? It's insane." Yeah. Um, but yeah, that piece in particular is just a creative powerhouse. So Nobuo Matsusan, thank you. You are a gent. Um, another one is Tommy Tallarico, um, mm. who is I I I really love his ability to adapt um, and grow into other disciplines. So. When I was at university, I did my dissertation on the emotional impacts and how emotion is used as a vehicle to connect player and game. Uh, sorry, yeah, player and gaming experience. So, and I got to know him and his work quite a bit during that research. Um, and of course, he he was he was quite quite fundamentally important in the sort of early to mid '90s. He worked on um, uh, Earthworm Jim, uh, Global Gladiators, and Terminator versus. Um, Robocop titles, something like that. I think I can't quite remember now. Um, but his, yeah, he was very, very good with innovating during those early years. Um, and of course, since then, he he now runs and performs in the video games live concert. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, um, the longest running video games concert ever, and it's amazing. Yeah. Founded in two thousand five, I think, and it's still going strong now. Um, and yeah, he's, I love his energy. He's, he's really addictive to kind of listen to and just watch. I've seen video games live twice and it just didn't disappoint. It's a great concert. It's so much fun. Yeah. Um, mentioned Elton John. I grew up listening a lot to Elton John. So even before I got massively interested in music, I was very influenced by those early, early songs. Everyone thinks of Elton John for his flamboyancy and these kind of outrageous, like crocodile rock and things like that. And I'm still standing. I see Elton John as Rocket Man and your song and all well, his okay, beautiful good. numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from 1969 to 1973, you will hear some of the best country, pop rock, straight rock, um, uh, ballads, theatrical pieces as well, even. Yeah. He's, he's, again, a creative powerhouse. Like yeah. He's so innovative, too. Um, and my wife and I are actually going to go and see his farewell tour next year, which I'm really excited wow. about. Are you going to go see the biopic? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, we have. <laughs> uh, we were talking about this only last night. Uh, we have once a month. We have our little date night, yeah. around about the twenty first, which was the anniversary of our, our wedding, the twenty first of October. Birthday. Oh, is it really? Well, twenty first oh, of May. Well, anyway. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we're, around about that time, we we try to have a date night. So, um, yeah, our, our little boy will be babysat, and then we're going to go and see Rocket Man, which I'm really excited about. I'm excited to see how they've they've made it a fantasy. So it's kind of like ABBA, with a, but, but but with a bit more of an edge. Yeah. It's a musical fantasy they describe it as, so I'm excited to see it. But yeah, just um, 
inevitably, um, I, I couldn't ignore all those early songs. Um, and even things like Come Down in Time, which is a really unheard of Elton John song on the Tumbleweed Connection album, I think. And it's just beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I've ever beautiful. heard that either. Yeah, listen to it. Come Down in Time is a wonderful piece of music. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's a huge influence. Uh, the Carpenters, too. Carpenters, sorry. Very much for the same reason. The songwriting prowess of Richard Carpenter is just amazing. Like he's so so good, and the vocal of Karen Carpenter is just galaxy chocolate <laughs> to my ears. Like it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, Philip Glass. I'm a big fan of minimalism. Yeah. Um, and I'm a fan of his um, Vangelis. Vangelis. How yeah. could you not? How could you not like Vangelis? Um, my favorite film of all time is Ghostbusters. Don't judge. It's a great film. Um, but my favorite soundtrack is uh, Blade Runner. Yeah. Just that that soundscape, that mood that it creates. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it it's just to die for. It's it so beautiful. good. Um, Daft Punk. I'm a big fan of them as well for the production and the pure enjoyment of the tracks they produce. Um, in terms of video game stuff. Um, Michael McCann, I'm a huge fan of his uh, for his Deus Ex scores um, and also his work on the reimagining of, of the XCOM games. Yeah. Um, he did the score to um, Enemy Unknown, uh, the, the first one. It was kind of rebranded, remade. Um, and quite often you'll hear me sneak in that kind of synth arpeggio that he's famous for in his um, Splinter Cell. Um, I think it's Double Agent he did the soundtrack to. That's really, really good. Um, Kevin Ripple, um, I'm, I'm not too familiar actually with, the, with his. Um, with his portfolio and his, his backlog of work, but his Gears of War score really took me by surprise. I thought Gears of War um, was just going to be this kind of mindless shooter, which it is kind of. You've got a chainsaw on your, on your Lancer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit mindless. But the soundtrack took me by surprise. It was really dark and moody and beautiful in places and boombastic and war frumpy. Like, it was really, really good. And that's one of my favourite scores. Um, and then, of course, Michael Giacchino, um, we, we mentioned Medal of Honor, um, he started his career um, largely in games before transitioning to film. He's almost like the heir to the throne for John Williams, really. He's now doing all, you know, many some Star Wars films and doing anything that is attached with J.J. Abrams. Okay. He's, he's a, a, a powerhouse um, in film score now. And um, his, that one particular score, Frontline, Medal of Honor, was just really, really delicate and really, really good. And I love that. Yeah. Um, so I could talk for hours, but he, th those are probably the key the key influences. Um, well, the next question was just going to be, are there any projects um, that you're like most proud of? I know you've talked about some already. Um, either it's projects that you've worked on, like on games, or if it's projects you've done yourself. Is there anything like you're really proud of and you're super happy with? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got, I, I could talk about a few. Um, firstly, Dark Future Blood Red States. Um, this is a game... Oroch Digital, the studio behind it, are a great studio. Um, I've worked with them a lot, and I cannot sing their praises enough. Um, they're just a really welcoming, warm studio that gave me a chance, and I'm forever, forever indebted to them. Um, they gave me a chance to work, and, and that relationship is still continuing to this day. Um, so props to those guys. And Thomas Rawlings um, is the head of it all, and he's an absolute gent and deserves all the praise he could possibly get. Um, but Dark Future Blood Red States is a, it's a real-time strategy game, but it's not a driving game. And the reason I emphasize that, I'll have to link you to the trailers, because it's, uh, it's the reimagining of a dormant um, Games Workshop IP from the 80s, like 1988, I think it came out. And it's kind of, um, in a nutshell, it's like the world of Mad Max um, with kind of kit-bashed cars. Um, the world has just gone really really badly um global warming you know just it, the world is in crisis almost but people are still trying to live lives so you have to um it, it's about being a road warrior and feeling like a badass on the road <laughs> taking out cars but you it's got this really cool um time dilation mechanic where you can slow time down to a crawl not it's not pausing it but it's mm. just really really slow almost like bullet time um and that's where the strategy part kicks in so it's an action game but strategy too so you could be surrounded by like four cars who are all just trying to take you out. And you're like, right, boom, space bar, let's think about this. And it's crawling along and you're like, okay, there's a car over there. He's got that much armor, but it's weak on this side. So I'll use my laser cannon to take that out on that. There's a car in front. I'll use my machine guns to take out his rear armor. Then I'm going to slam the brakes on, take out the guy behind me, whilst then applying some road spike or something to take out all these cars. And then you can either you can action those commands during the time dilation and watch them all play out or remove yourself from command mode 
um, which is the the time dilation, and then just watch it all play out in real time. And it's 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 described as being when you played the original game uh, back in the eighties. Of course, it's a slow, it's a much slower experience. Mm. But the the team at Oric Digital are describing it as being what plays out in your head during a board game playthrough. So all that kind of drama, suspense, and action, and kind of outrageous things that are happening in and around you, that's what plays out during the video game adaptation of it because it is so kind of well, it's just outrageous. Some of the things that happen, it's really really fun. You could be, you could blow a car into the into the air, and then go into command mode, slow down time, and then fire back up at it with a laser, with a, a combat laser, or something, blow it onto the other car whilst there's a collision behind you and then a car ends up piggybacking you. It's just carnage. It's <laughs> utter, utter carnage. Um, but that's, I'm really proud of that because taking, adapting a board game uh, into a video game format is, is a real challenge because, you know, things mechanically change quite a lot and you have to kind of create something new. Uh, and then you, you end up kind of, um, splitting, but you know, you could split a fan base. You've got these dedicated fans who want an adaptation of the, or, or they want a, a real, truthful reimagining of what they loved on the board. But then you have to kind of modernize it, and of course, it has to sell, it has to make money, and it has mm. to kind of attract a new audience. So what they've what they've done with this is really cool. Of course, I'm not, I can't go into loads of too much detail about it, yeah. but it's just really, really satisfying to play, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, and that's a Games Workshop IP, and that comes out on May 16th. It's, it's available for wish listing on Steam, um, and it's a really cool game. But I'm f- I'm f- really really fond and proud of that for just the work that's gone on. Certainly in ND- in indie development, you know, we don't have the budgets that Rockstar have and all this kind of stuff. You know, yeah. So this game has spent about three years in development. That's quite a long time. Um, for for the studio to be working on it, you know, other studios might have said, you know what, it's not working. We're going to have to shelve it, right? Mm. But they stuck with it. They saw the potential with this thing because there really isn't anything else quite like it. So they stuck with it, and and it's gone through a slight reimagining within itself, and and it's been worth the wait and the man hours to to get it to the state that it's at now. It's really really good, really 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 good. Um, there is one particular track I'd love to play from um, Dark Future, which which has featured on one of the Oric Digital podcasts already. Um, and that's a track called Stomping Ground. The reason I really I really like it is because I always try to work actual audio into uh, into my composition. Um, compositions these days instead of relying too much on sample libraries that's fine but y- you can only really go so far with it you need to be more creative so there's a there's an environment in um dark future called stomping ground and i was looking at that thinking well what do i do with this what, what does this place sound like and it's called stomping ground so i'm like right okay it needs to sound aggressive and i started thinking about like a trash band like st- actual stomping mm. so i i've got a cello i'm lucky lucky enough to have a very good cello which, if, if you were a professional cello player, you'd probably slap me for the, the, the amount of awful things I've done to it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I took that and recorded it and just grinded up the strings. I hit it with the bow, you know, really kind of, really expressed myself on, on the cello. Um, but I used that in this recording and it sounds really cool for it. Um, it sounds aggressive and it's dirty and it's big and it's got a lot to say for itself. Um, it's like I compared it to like the Jack Russell of industrial tracks or something. It's it, it's a small track but thinks it's bigger than it is. <laughs> it's got a big personality, um, and also that synth that Michael McCann synth arpeggio makes it into there as well. So the two things combined is just I really enjoyed putting that together. That's a lot of fun to listen to. Thank you. 
Awesome. Um, two other games. Another game which was one of my first ones that I worked on was a game called Mech Mania, which unfortunately didn't... Um, that one did get shelved and it, it didn't, didn't see release. But the soundtrack was a real interesting one. I, I re, repackaged it and called it Synthwave Mech Pulse Pop. <laughs> and that, that is a genre that I am definitely pe- penning. Because if you listen to it, it's, it's on my Spotify and Bandcamp. And um, it's essentially Synthwave versus Chiptune. Cool. And it's just, it's just mad. Like, there isn't anything... I, I don't think there's anything original about it. It's just a really, really hectic listen. There's only five tracks, but I extended the tracks to make something more musical of them. Um, and they weren't ever fully mixed because the, the game... The cues were, but then it went on quite a, a while before the cues came back to me. And by that point, the project files were just, I don't know where they'd gone. Yeah. So I just did a bit of a rehash and a slight mix of these straight cues whilst trying to extend them w- within a new session. Anyway, I'm really proud of that because it was a side project and it allowed me to express myself. And there was no kind of glitch plugins or anything involved. All the, all the craziness that exists is, is handcrafted. It's sequenced note by note by me, and it was a real kind of labor of love for about six months. I love it. Um, and another one is a, a game called Laser Disco Defenders, which I worked with the uh, Out of Bounds Games, um, and the developer, developer behind that is a guy called Alexander Burke, who worked on 1111 Memories Retold, which you might have heard of. It's, it's, it's doing quite well for nominations and awards at the moment. It had. Um, Olivier de Rivier, I think yeah. his name is, oh, the yeah. French guy. Yeah, he's a, real, he's a real big, big name at the moment. He did the score for it. Um, so Alexander Burke is a really, really interesting guy. Um, and Laser Disco Defenders is this kind of twin-stick bullet hell shooter whereby, if you imagine the Power Rangers, um, <laughs> but the... So the world has had its music stolen. All music as we know it has been stolen. Yeah. And it's been stolen by this guy called Lord Monotone. Um, it, it's it doesn't it's not a game that places itself too much in reality. Um, so, but the, it, the world calls on these guys, the laser disco defenders, to get the to steal back the music and give it back to the world. But they do this while shooting lasers from their fingertips, mm-hmm. and they're all kind of caked in disco attire with flares and uh, platforms and Afros. medallions and stuff. Afros, yeah. <laughs> and it's a really really fun, very arcadey. Very arcadey game, um, but it's incredibly addictive, and the the difficulty is a challenge. I think one of the early things said about it when it came out was that it was probably too hard, but it's got that draw because it is hard. Mm. You know, you just want to go back to it and just beat your score from the last time and the next time and the next time. So that's available on Steam. Uh, I think it might still be on PS4. I'm not entirely sure, and it was on PS Vita as well. Um, but the real sorry, the real reason I love that game is because. At the time, I was engaged, and everything I earned from that game paid for the engagement ring that I then <laughs> gave to, to my now wife. So she can never complain that games never did anything for her because they, <laughs> <laughs> they bought her engagement ring. Um, and also, as, a, as another thing, I had the artist who uh, provided the art on the game to produce a piece of artwork of myself and, and my wife, and I gave that to her as well. And it was, it's kind of almost set within the universe of Laser Disco Defender. So it's just like this, this little bubble um, that I kind of created, um, but it's got a real sentimentality surrounding it now. So those three projects in particular are, are really, really important to me. Awesome. Where, where do you want to take your career in the future? Are there anything that you'd really love to work on? Any styles of stuff you really want to work on? Um, I mean, the ultimate goal for me, I would love to get to a point where I could call myself an audio director right. um, and, and be managing um, perhaps a small team or even if I'm still doing the creative work myself, I would love to kind of work towards that. There's a lot more to learn. I've only really just started implementing myself and working more in, a, in engine. So, you know, that's, that's some way off, but that, that would be a really great place to get towards. Um, but having said that, I'm, I'm really quite happy working as a creative designer at the moment in music and sound, and, and I'm enjoying all my sound recorders work. So I'm in a really, really happy place. Um, in terms of, I don't know, it's, it's a good question. I mean, if, if Ui Matsu called me up and said, <laughs> look, Matt, we've got this idea and we want to work with you on it, I'd be like, let me check my diary. <laughs> <laughs> let me cross <laughs> everything out in it. <laughs> let me just remove everything. Yes, I will be there tomorrow. Um, How much no are flights problem. to Japan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, if, if someone 
called me up um, and like of that caliber, I would absolutely love to work with one of my heroes like that. Mm. Having said that, though, and to, to link back to Auric Digital, I was really amazed and have found it somewhat of a challenge to be in the presence of um, Dr. Thomas Rawlings, the design director of Auric Digital, because only my not being last year, maybe the year before, so 2017, I found out that he was lead designer or at least one of the designers on The Great Escape, which was a PS2 game. And that was one of my favorite games on the PS2. And I had no idea that he was part of that dev team. Hmm. So when I found that out, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like you are a completely different person to me now. This, yeah. is, this, is, this is kind of mad. Um, and when I said that to him, he just kind of shook it off and just went, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. It's just another game. And I was like, no, it's really not. <laughs> like, that's, a, that's a big deal to me, huge deal. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, that, that, that's, I'm kind of working with all my heroes already. Awesome. I get, do you think it's harder to work with someone when you kind of elevate them to a deity? I, I think so. <laughs> Especially, I mean, if you ever meet one of your heroes, of course, we, we're very good at them building up a picture of what you think they're going to be like or sound like or how they're going to conduct themselves. And mm -hmm. if they're none of those things, it's almost inevitable that they're going to disappoint you, you know? Yeah. Um, I was quite surprised, actually. I met Graham Norton once. Okay. <laughs> And um, and he's everything you'd expect him to be. Yeah. He's just the same guy. So when I met him, I was like, ah, oh, cool. You're not just a character. That's I'm. Cheers, man. Like you've re <laughs> you've renewed my faith in all that is television. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think if 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 you're working with them though, that's different. I think because of course, especially if money's involved and time and pressures, you know, that can bring out the best and worst in people. And and if um. If, if it proves itself to be a challenge, everything that you know could be crushed or it could be made even stronger. Mm. Who knows until you get there? You, you just never know. I think if you have a relationship with someone where you're working with them, it mm. changes that relationship as well. Like if I just met one of my heroes, I'm quite insignificant to them. Whereas if I'm working right. with them, then mm. they have a reason to know who I am and talk to me. And Yeah, that it's would... almost like you have a voice then, don't you? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a voice and you have an opinion. But if you just bump into them, it's almost like... I am not worthy. and you Absolutely. Know, That's who you know. I turn into whenever I meet anyone I really like. I turn into a, I really like you. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I embarrass myself quite a lot is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. We've all been there. Yeah. 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 Within, within making music, what would you say you would say, I, c I could never, ever work without that one thing? It's, it's, it's very easy for us to say, oh, my favourite library is this, or I use this piano, I use this interface, or whatever. We, we kind of geek out and talk about tech stuff, and that's yeah. fine. But my most valuable tool is silence, patience, and just time away from work. Because, again, I, I don't, we've, we've, we've played the philosophical card already. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going <laughs> to do it. About five times. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go there. But my point is, without that, I don't think I'd be at the stage that I'm at now. I really, really don't. And I absolutely believe that. Um, so those things, I will always apply that before the start of a new project. And then, of course, throughout production as well. I will always manage my mindset and make sure that I'm in the, the best possible state to produce good work. Um, I mean, it, it might just be, you know, smoke and mirrors. Some people can just bash it out and just go, right, boom, here's, here's a great track. And it's much more kind of work focused. Yeah, but for me it's not. It, you know, this is a job that um, I've worked really hard to kind of get to. So I'm very protective of it, and I don't want it to ever feel like it's work because it, it just shouldn't be. You know, it's something that I really enjoy, and I don't want to. I don't want to tamper with that. If it ever feels like work, then I need to change my practice and change my approach. Mm. So anyway, sorry. Those those things are really important. Those are my actual tools. If you want to talk specifically about music, then. Um, and work stuff. I'm a big fan of native instruments libraries. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think there's, there's probably more credible string and brass samples out there, but I've always really enjoyed working with native instruments um, libraries. I love that the fact that uh, the fact with them is it's all very much in one place. You get native native access. Everything's kind of libraried out for you. It's really easy to install, really easy to work with, and I love that. The less time I can spend installing stuff the longer yeah. I can spend on a project. Mm. Um, I'm not a fan of kind of working in and out and, and you know, changing things, changing technical things. I just want to get stuck in when I'm in, the, when I'm in the right place and I'm ready to start producing music and audio. I just want to get in there and know that I've got some trusted libraries to work with. Um, some other ones, though, are... I forget who actually produces these, but they're called Crush, Dirt, Freak and Bite. 
They're, they're really, really cool distortion and bit crushing plugins. We've used them quite a lot on the podcast that we do. Um, and they're just really fun to work with. Mm. Um, I, I've used this quite a lot. Of course, I'm a piano player, so my piano samples that I use are the grandeur, but more favorable to me is the Unicorda, which is a naked piano. You ever heard of this? No. I haven't, no. So a naked piano is exactly that. It's a piano without any of the casing. Okay. So it, there's, there's no body to it. It's just all the guts. Okay. Um, and it's kind of, it was innovated and, and produced, or at least affiliated with Niels Fram, who's the, uh, I think he's a German or Belgian composer, piano player. I think he's German. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. Um, but he produced this, this, this new piano sound, and it's just got this so textured, and you can change everything from the felt that's used. Do you use silk? Do you use cloth or felt? You can change everything about the ambience, of course, how much of the sustained strings do you hear the pedal the keys it's so customizable that's something i really really enjoy geeking out about because the bass sample alone is really really good Hmm. so not basses in bass notes that you know the the bass default setting let's call it yeah it's really really good and you can just jump straight and start using that but there's just a lot of scope to kind of flesh that out and customize this piano which is just like it's kind of saying here's all the body parts you arrange them how you want. Do you put the lungs there or the heart over here? What about the, the intestines? Do you want to put that over there? You know, you can really kind of spread it out and play around with all the textures that it creates. And I've used that a lot, and it's really, really fun. It's the spore of pianos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I really like that. Did you say you can add in even like the percussion sound of someone hitting the keys and, and the actual sound of the pedals and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, so of course, when you, if you're playing a live piano, um, when you apply the sustain pedal, that, that's going to make a sound yeah, yeah, of resonance yeah. within the bodies. So you can you can play with that. They've mic'd everything up separately and they've sampled it separately, and wow. then you can kind of really, really, really use it and think about where that's placed in in your piano mix. That's awesome. And the same, it is really cool. And, and the same is true for when you hit the keys as well, because of course something physical is happening. There is a hammer hitting a string. Yeah, it's going to make a sound that kind of clunk. Yeah. Um, I always find. You, I don't tend to overindulge too much, so I, I love the subtleties to it. So you'll be playing a piece of a piece of piano music, and you can hear these very subtle, like, clunk, 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 you know, yeah, and, yeah. and that just adds such texture. Have you ever listened to Aphex Twin? There's an Aphex Twin song on his Drugs album, where, and I think he put the microphone literally on the strings, and you can oh, really right. hear the percussion of every string, and it's kind of yeah. part of the song. It's no, like, I, I will check that out. I'm not too familiar with them, but I, I will certainly check that out. Yeah, it's awesome. Anything piano-based. When, when, when a piano is used uh, more than just a piano, that mm. instantly draws me in, because yeah. I want to know how people are using it in more kind of um, avant-garde ways, you yeah. know. Because it's such a bulky thing to look at, but it's got so much personality and you can do so much with it. Mm. Um, and, and it takes composers like Nils Fram to kind of think about it and go, right, I'm going to make this available to the masses. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the Unicorder, especially the Naked Piano, it's a great name as well, yeah. um, is, is really, really gu- good to use. And that, that gets good run out on most of my projects when, when a piano is needed. Awesome. Cool. Well, I know what I'm going to be getting next. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm in the market for a <laughs> piano library. Like, I don't have any piano at all apart from one that came with the um, East West Orchestra stuff there's yeah, one piano yeah. in there it sounds nice but it's got one mic that's it and you can't really do anything mm. with it the other one that's, that's always the challenge especially with strings like you want to when you're working with digital music of course you, we want it to sound real we want it to sound like I've got an orchestra in my, in my studio because yeah. we don't all have that we certainly don't have the budget to commission something like that yeah um so when sample libraries like that come out, like the Unicorder and many of the high-end string packages now, you know, there's a lot of flexibility and creativity around how, how you use them. And also just the quality of how it's recorded. Yeah. You know, it, it puts an orchestra at, in your fingertips. Mm. And these things are worth investing in. Um, I, I think the Unicorder alone, from memory, I've had it for a couple of years now, it wasn't too... It, it didn't cripple me financially, let's say that. <laughs> it was, it's very affordable, and it, it's something... If you're a piano player and having more of a textured sound to your sound is important, then absolutely you should invest in it because it's really, really good. It, it comes highly recommended by Matthew Walker of Seb Audio, without a shadow. <laughs> so I think the final question we had um, was, are there any, any real tips on uh, breaking into the video game industry? Yeah, um... I think, I think we've loosely touched on this before already. Um, but again, it's it's very easy to say, "Oh, go go to networking events, do this, you know, do yeah. these kind of things." Um, 
I, I found, um, or I, rather I find now, the best way to network is to not network. If, if you go in yeah. being a bit of a salesman, people see through that. Yeah. Um, in, certainly in the games industry, you have to develop professional friendships. It's more of a friendship-based experience. And that's where that dialogue comes from. Because it's full of geeks. We all just love talking about board <laughs> games and novels and film and other games. And, you know, we all love talking about that kind of stuff. So you mm. develop friendships very quickly. But, of course, you're working on projects and money is involved and budgets and time and, and lives. It's that serious, mm. you know. So you, you have to develop these professional friendships. Um, the best way to do that, firstly, is just be yourself. Like, don't try to... Don't try to be anything other than that because that is the one thing that is unique to you. If you go in there trying to sort of be, um, oh, I'm going to be a hard sell and say, look, you, you need to work with me, you're just going to turn people mm. off. Yeah. You're going to turn people off and you'll very quickly find that you have zero work with that approach. Mm. Um, so, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but perseverance is key. This is really, really important. I think when you're starting out, it, it doesn't happen overnight. There's, there's no sugarcoating that. Like, if you want to develop a full-time job within the games industry, yeah, you could go and apply for one if you're trained and you have a, a game science or programming or game audio degree now. There's, even in Bristol, there's a game audio degree course. Um, these things weren't available to me when I was studying, so that's, that wasn't my story. I had to get out there and get my hands dirty and just do that and be an indie. So I had to kind of freelance. Um, so if you go down that route, fine, you might just walk straight into a job. That's cool. Um, but if you're looking to be freelance, um, being flexible, so we, we talked about you know, diversifying your discipline a bit. That's really important, but just don't spread yourself thinly. Never say that you can do something if mm. you can't do it. Mm. There is an element of like, if you're on a project, and there is always an element of like saying yes and then figuring it out afterward. There's always a little bit of that. Yeah. But don't let it, don't allow it to become a detriment to the project because you're only going to make yourself look a fool uh, and you will not likely work with that developer ever again. Mm. So, you know, be confident in your abilities and be confident in your abilities to learn things. Um, so flexible, perseverance is really, really key. Um, just looking at my notes. Uh, yeah, so again, much on the diversifying thing. If you're, if you're looking to get into game music... That's cool. There's a lot of work out there for you, but that's, that's quite a one-dimensional approach. So that's only going to get you so far if you are just a music person. Because I'm, I'm by, by trade, I'm not an audio person. Um, there was audio stuff at university, but I went into university as a musician mm. uh, and played in bands and function bands. Um, here's a bit of trivia for you. I was, I was once part, once the lead vocalist of Europe's largest Scissor Sisters tribute band. <laughs> what were they and, called? Uh, what were you called? Well, Scissor Sisters, but with a Z at the end. Oh. It was oh, I was innovative, man. You could have been um, called we si actually, Scissor Brothers. Scissor Brothers. <laughs> that just, that, I don't think people were ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually supported McFly. Oh, wow. We, we, yeah, we supported McFly. They were doing the Cheltenham Christmas light switch on, and we supported them for a gig. It's, you know, I've got so many fun stories to talk about that. Awesome. And that was, a really, that was my job through university. I did that for three years and didn't have to work in a bar or anything. That was my job for three mm. years, almost every weekend gigging all over the country. It was amazing. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Um, so, I, you know, I, I went to university as a musician um, and whatnot. But um, I knew very quickly as, as, my, as my dialogue with developers was developing, kind of sounds weird, too many developing words there. Um, as I became aware of this, you, you have to become a bit more of a department. Because again, if you, th if you look at it, if you're, a, if you're someone with a budget and you, ha you have a game, Keeping things controlled becomes really important. Dialogue and that conversation is really important to manage. If you have too many things spread out, that's just more work to make sure that you're checking in with, oh, that person's doing the, audio, the sound design, that person's doing the podcast for us, that person's doing the music. Already there's three audio jobs that one person could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you, you want to diversify, but without spreading yourself too thin. Like, we keep talking about that, but um, it, I can't hit that home enough. Mm. It's just really, really important. So going in with just music, that's only going to get you so far. Um, and also, in terms of tech, much of it translates anyway. So we're you know, using a door, plugins, um, libraries and whatnot. All these things transfer to just audio work anyway. So it's actually quite an easy transition I've found to, to make. Um, so those are my real points. It's, that's all I can really say about it, really, from my experience. Um, 
just being patient. And the biggest thing I guess I could say is listening. Listening is a real skill. Um, if you go into a meeting and, and you're thinking in the sense that, that I must say what I think they want me to say, mm. that's not a good approach. You just listen, be part of the dialogue and, and, and just be part of that, that aura. Um, again, it comes back to sort of not kidding yourself and, and being something that you're not. Just be truthful. And that's the sort of person that people want to work with. Honesty is key. Truth is key. Be a good guy and mm. it'll work out for you. This is a little bit of a tangent, but do you ever feel like you have imposter syndrome? Is that uh, thing of... All the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All, all the time. Good. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you're it, it's, it kind of goes with the territory a little bit when you're if you're a creative thinker our brains are slightly different they fire slightly differently mm. and um, you know it, it's very easy to kind of slip into a mindset where into a negative mindset especially and you have to kind of work hard to sort of know what your worth is and, and know where you're good and that's where again um, being mindful and just taking time out can be a really good investment in yourself mm. even during a project too because you might be thinking well you know the pressure's on the deadline's on i need to get get work done but a better strategy strategy sometimes is just to take a step back and go well look, if i work it's not going to be good work i might as well take a, an hour or two out yeah um and then go back fully charged with a better way of thinking sorry that didn't really answer the imposter syndrome thing too much but um it's all relative all related and it's all very important yeah absolutely is there any other projects that you would like to mention on the podcast? Um, yeah. So, again, with Oric Digital, we, we talk exclusively about all the projects we work on within a podcast that is relatively new. It's on its third season now, um, and this th third season has been dark future specific and dedicated. Uh, we've even got, um, hopefully, a very, very interesting and show-stopping interview coming up with, with, a, with a good name. Um, so it's it's all things Oric Digital, and we cover all projects. And it's called How to Make a Game with Oric Digital, and it's available on via Podbean on iTunes and all the rest of it. There's so many platforms for podcasts. There's now, so man. many. <laughs> it's too many, almost too many. But it's um, if you want to learn anything about what we're doing within um, the Games Workshop IP that we're working on, um, and also how Oric Digital go about making a game, it's it's that kind of podcast where it's an opportunity to get within the wires of it all mm. um you know it's not just face value and it's not us just trying to sell stuff it's like no this is how we work this is these are the people that put these things together this is what this is what drives us this is what influences us these these are the people within these departments get to know them and it's it's really really fun there's a lot of banter matt davis the host um is is a great a great banter banter man oh. um and he'll probably hate me for he's always on the hustle that's his thing he's always hustling that's his kind of catchphrase um but uh yeah he he runs it and produces it and i record and i co-press for him um but yeah check that it's a really really cool podcast and uh, we're having a lot of fun producing it awesome well i'll be sure to listen i listen to so many podcasts <laughs> I, I try my best to um but again there's just it's much like netflix as well it's really difficult to kind of get into something I find these mm. days because there is so much choice. Mm. You kind of have to rely on word of mouth really nowadays, yeah. don't you? Yeah, it takes for someone to go, oh, have you seen this? No, oh, check it out. And then it becomes the, another thing you add to your wish list. Yeah. yeah. Never and then get you feel like you're it. disappointing people if you haven't listened to it. Next time you see them, you're like, hey, did you, did you check that thing out? You're like, oh, yeah, ne nearly. It's, <laughs> it's the same thing. You know when you were saying about um, if someone doesn't agree with your opinion on the best film ever or something? <laughs> yeah. When they say, oh, have you watched this? You say no. And they go, oh, my God, you haven't seen it. Yeah. As if it's like you've offended them. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, I just haven't gone round to like it. You. I'm sorry. It does sound like me. <laughs> Can I just uh, take this time to apologise to everyone I've ever interacted with? Uh, <laughs> I, I like podcasts, though, because you can listen to them while you're doing something else. Whereas yeah, Netflix, yeah. you have to take time out of your day and think, right, I'm going to sit down for an hour yeah. and invest in this thing. Well, I listen to nine hours of podcast a day while I'm doing my job. So, Gosh. <laughs> yeah. Podcasting, yeah, it, it's really flexible. And it's kind of a non-intrusive way of listening and learning stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, it slots into anyone's lifestyle much easier than anything that Netflix could. could and I you. hope that we can slot into your life, listener, with our informative... <laughs> <laughs> lovely podcast <laughs> it's true true story cool well um thanks very much matt for coming on to our podcast it's okay you're welcome 
and uh, I hope I hope you've enjoyed it. Well, I'll have my people talk to your people, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll be sending some very very shirty emails uh, to your to your that, HR department. Or that's something. fine. That goes straight through to William. I can ignore those. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a blast. I, I'm really flattered that you guys invited me on. Um, and I hope that what I've said is, um, you know, adds some kind of nugget of clarity to anyone who's trying to break into into the game industry. I mean, I've still got a long way to go. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit further ahead than a newbie might be. Um, but, you know, I, I've got things that I want to do and places that I want to sort of aim towards. Um, but I'm still... I'm still writing my own book, really. Yeah. I, just, I don't want to end on a philosophical note. but <laughs> no, it's you like, have to. I'm it's, still it's been writing a theme. the pages. <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. fountain pen is full. <laughs> yeah, and it's now getting low on ink. My gosh. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Awesome. I've really enjoyed it as well, man. Well, that was nice. Yeah, it was. I enjoyed it. It was a good episode. Mm. Lots and lots of information in there. Yeah, um, you know, lots of research to do, lots of documents to have a little look at, lots of links to clicky click. Yeah, we'll put all the stuff in the show notes, put all the links to Matthew in there so you can check out his work, see the games that he's doing at the moment. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, make yep. sure you follow us on Twitter, make at sure you follow Composer Stephen Cast. Fry- what? Hmm? <laughs> you still need to get on Twitter? I do, personally. Yeah. But. Well, you've got the Composer Class one, you can go on there. Yeah, I can. Don't, but you know. <laughs> apparently, I just get a lot of flack for impersonating champs badly. That was, yeah, you did. Two weeks in a row I've mentioned that now. Didn't, <laughs> I didn't take it to heart, did I? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening this far. Uh, if you're not subscribed, bloody subscribe, you bloody idiot. Um, and we've got a Patreon, and we've got an iTunes, and we've got a Spotify. And, and anywhere else you, you can possibly listen, or just listen on the website. I think, actually, looking at it, our most popular place for people to listen is Chrome. It's Chrome. It, well, actually, I think it's just been surpassed by CastBox. Ooh. So most people listen on there, and then the next one is Chrome. Nice. Yeah. Well, so wherever, listen, listen everywhere. Wherever you listen, do it. Do a listen. Listen nice. And uh, uh, we've got a few more interviews lined up, haven't we? So there'll be more podcasts like this. There'll be more podcasts with me waffling on about VR because I am obsessed with it. Uh, and William will be... Uh, I'll be here. In his belly. 